Hi, uh, I'm Josh Kui, and uh, my project was on nutrient distribution and cycling across the Mississippi River's channel and floodplain. And so um, I worked in the same lab as Lisa, and um, on the top left there you can see um, just Dr. Casimo with the PVC sampler just before it like just refused to work. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the anchor right below, so yeah. So um, like um, several other people have um, also worked on, on my project. The purpose of my project was to like just better understand like the nutrient dynamics in the Mississippi, in the Mississippi and to um, sort of, I guess, like understand how we can best like mitigate its impact on eutrophication in receiving waters down in the Gulf of Mexico. And so eutrophication is where um, in a body of water it get, receives um, high levels of normally limiting nutrients resulting in um, the proliferation of algae and the subsequent deoxy deoxygenation of that ecosystem. And so, um, like the Mississippi is river basin is um, just highly dominated by agriculture and is like just a major contributor to eutrophication in the Gulf of Mexico. So like I said, eutrophication is like a pretty, um, it's highly detrimental to its like affected ecosystem and um, just like causes hypoxia, creates toxins, and um, overall just makes the environment just super hostile to aerobic life, which is like most um, things, of, which is like will be most organisms and um, will ends up having like a lot of like economic and like health impacts on like, just, on, um, like human activity as well. So one potential mitigating factor for uh, this eutrophication is the um, is like the deposition of nutrients molecules before it like reaches the re like receiving waters, particularly through the mechanism of absorption, where through like just the like atomic structure of like these, the surface of these like sediment materials can um, like. Mo like nutrient molecules can like attach to them and then end up deposited along the floodplain and on the banks and get like just like taken out of the like water column and just like and be um, like stored outside of and just not transported downstream. So, um, research question for the summer was to whether uh, sediment accumulation in just like these backwater areas could help reduce nutrient loads through just like um, just act acting as like a storage area and so we sampled at three sites along the Mississippi um, on like a transect of Mississippi consisting of the at the middle and on the bank of the main channel as well as in the backwater of Alta Slough and then we also took um, like weekly grab samples of water from just like surface samples across from on the Alton side um, to just get a better get like a better understanding of just like the overall like characteristics of like this <clears throat> of the, um, the water over time. And then this time series data was supplemented with um, an archive of older data from the same spot, um, searching back for a few more months back to March. And so once we had our data, um, we basically just ran, um, we just like tested them for like nutrient levels, for um, it's like particle size, uh, total suspended solid, basically just, just do whatever we can to um, just best like characterize these um, samples. And then, um, we also used um, like, pour, took pore water and um, like, Case, uh, DDI and KCL extractions for the pore water and loosely bound nutrients that would be for the um, like the sediment samples themselves. And so over time, um, we found as you can see here, we found that like nutrients in the river tended to trend pretty closely with total suspended solids and um, di river discharge. As you can see with the, with like those parallel peaks. Um, and those, the floating points there are water samples from the sites where we got sa our sediment samples from. But um, so when we actually, but while um, like there's just like it seems to be like a pretty good trend there, the, it was actually like not significant when we actually like did the regression.
And so for the sediments, um, we found that the nutrient levels increased towards the floodplain and um, well, and so we end up having some trouble with like the data for the um, like the pore water extractions, but for the KCL um, extractions of like the new, loosely bound nutrients on the top left there, which would be like the stuff that's like it's like stored long term, you can see um, there's like definitely stuff being stored in the sediments, and that there's like a steady increase as you go like further out along the floodplain. Um, this like there's like a similar trend there with like the organic matter and sort of just um, in terms of just like um, just like carbon um, based materials that are also getting stored and there was um, also like pretty high increase in just like a percent composition of nitrogen and carbon and um, so one like part of why this um, was the case was likely because of the abundance of like clay sized particles in like these areas which would have um, increased the like just have better they would um, like have greater like ad adhesiveness and um, just overall like have be just have like an easier time like sticking to each other and like trapping additional like materials within them compared to like the larger sediments in the main channel and so um, basically our results here is like indicate the possibility of like nitrogen species binding within the uh, bank and backwater sediments. And um, so yes, uh, to conclude, um, like nutrients in the water column, they were like high in the spring and tended to follow fluctuations in discharge and TSS. Um, the sediment bound nutrients were um, more concentrated in backwater than in the main channel and would which um, would indicate that bank and backwater sediments could act as at least temporary sinks for organic material and nitrogen species nutrients, which um, could provide a means of mitigating uh, nutrient loading downstream. Uh, I wanted to thank Dr. Hassan Miller for advising me on this project and for uh, grad student Emily Persinger for um, just helping me, helping me in the field in the lab and for um, letting me use her um, archive data and also thanks to Dr. Sloan and Trace Pasley from NGREG for um, helping with sampling and, and um, for like running our samples. Um, any questions? Uh, yeah. yeah, I forget John, did you do like a texture analysis of the sediments um, that, that we collected? Like um, I know Liz has a an instrument for doing that. Were you able to do like a texture analysis? Yeah. Um, so you know that the stuff in the backwater was like fine. I think you said something about iron clay. Yeah. So the stuff in the backwater was just like a lot finer than in the main channel, which, which yeah. Well, Liz says, great job, Josh, in the chat. I was curious, like, you said that the, the sometimes what you were trying to use to take the samples didn't really work or cooperate. Um, did you guys mark which ones you did use that technique um, for versus when you didn't? Um, we just, like, didn't use that technique. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Yeah, the device did it great. Yeah. It didn't. It wasn't. Yeah, I think it was something about the, like, the sediment itself that it just kept like sliding out. It was too yeah. fine. It would like just slip through the filters with everything else. So we had to like centrifuge them and then like gently try to pour them out. And some of them, the first time that we tried to do that because we hadn't tried it before, like we just dropped a couple of the test tubes, so we lost the samples. Mm -hmm. Got it. Dr. Hassan Mueller said the clay was uh, armoring the bottom. Probably to keep. Uh, sorry. Uh, Dr. Hassan Mueller just say that said the clay was armoring the bottom. Okay. So I'm assuming yeah. that's why the thing couldn't work. Yeah. 